Okay, so uh, it's nice to have a chance to revisit this old subject. Um, I'm going to, uh, it's sort of divided into two halves. Um, the first half is, uh, is just going to be a little bit of the, the history as, as, as I recall it and as I've come to know it. Um, and uh, you'll notice that we're just going to be starting in 1945. And uh, I'll explain why we're on the next transparency, why it starts in 1945. Um, and then the latter part of the talk will be, um, so that's sort of some general things. And um, I want to get to something specific in the latter part of the talk, which is specific and specifically about octonions. And I will first of all, to do that, I first of all have to introduce some work uh, that was done by the bunch of people, number of people that you see in green there in the middle um, on essentially Lorentz harmonics, celestial spheres and so on. And this is related to, to the, the, related to the kind of Penrose's idea um, and twisted transforms and so on. And then, in the, then I will actually get to the, an application of some of those ideas to, to develop this twisted transform or twisted light transform for the super young mills case. And uh, out of that will, will come basically a very specific connection with the uh, norm division algebras RCHO. Uh, okay, so first of all, let's get to the, the history part. Ah, I'm having a trouble moving this down to the next. My button was working. Oh, let me see if I can just activate it somehow. Oh, here we go. Good. Uh, <clears throat> So actually the history really begins, I think, in 1944-45, because there's a paper by Dirac in the Proceedings of the Royal Irish Academy. Of course, that was uh, you know, the, the, one of the famous members of that academy was, ha was Hamilton. So that may account for why the paper is, is in that particular journal. But also, of course, 44 was also wartime. So maybe uh, that 44-45, maybe they simply didn't publish it until the till the war was over. But in any case, he has a paper in that uh, journal um, and it doesn't cite anybody and it has never been cited. In fact, I've never seen it. I've seen it cited only once in a paper, uh, in a journal paper or a preprint. And, and that's because I told the authors about it. <laughs> um, I actually learned about it myself from an obituary written by some Russian physicist of Dirac. And uh, it's uh, when I got hold of it, I was I, I was astounded actually to see what was in it. Let me I, let me just it's a, a quick uh, uh, anecdote. I can preface this by saying I actually heard Dirac speak. I think it was in 1976 thereabouts in MIT. It was introduced by Penrose, and what he said largely he said in the talk or what I remember of it. He says there were two topics in mathematics that he'd always been very interested in, but had never really been able to use in physics. And those two topics were quaternions and projective geometry. And it's precisely those two topics that he combined in this paper uh, in the, um, from 1944-45. It's all so virtually unknown. But what he did was to uh, uh, point out that the uh, Lawrence group he didn't do it quite in this, in this order, but essentially what he did was to point out that the Lorentz group in a six dimensional Minkowski space time can be viewed as the special linear group of two tie two matrices over the quaternions. And essentially he did that by actually starting with, the, in, by, with an application of that group as a fractional linear transformations on the celestial four sphere. So he was in, four, in a four sphere in six dimensions, which is the, um, projective, uh, quaternionic projective line. And of course, well, he was actually interested in Minkowski transformation, uh, excuse me, Lorentz transformations in four dimensions, uh, because in those days it would have been absurd to start discussing physics in six dimensions. And so this was by way of, he first of all introduced that and then he could, tried to get down to four dimensions. And he did that essentially by saying that four-dimensional space-time would be embedded in this larger six-dimensional space-time. Um, and then, well, of course, what happens is that the, uh, uh, the SL2H basically breaks down into an SL2C, 
which is then he discussed in this quaternionic language. That's of course acting by fractional linear transformations on the celestial two sphere. There is an extra U1 that which appears in, in, in this. And I put, I put that in here in, in a different color because Dirac didn't mention it, but it'll turn out that somehow that always appears whenever you do, whenever you look at these things over the complex, you go, when you look at the real complex quaternions, quaternions, octonians, and you focus on the complex case, you always get this extra U1 factor coming up as, as we'll see. So this was 20 years uh, before uh, Penrose, I think, and, uh, and certainly 40 years before I started to think about it. So, uh, some of these things in the, in the six dimensional context, which I'll come to in a moment or two. So um, essentially my introduction to this whole, whole idea was uh, when I went to Japan, I think it was in, well, in, 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 in 82 or thereabouts. Um, and um, at that time, I went to give some lectures uh, on supergravity in Kyoto University at the invitation of Taichiro Kugo. And uh, while I was looking at some things in his room, I came across this dictionary of Japanese mathematics. Uh, many, some of you, not dictionary, it was an encyclopedia of Japanese mathematics, which was only in Japanese at that time. But it was the, uh, but nevertheless, I leafed through it and I found some interesting tables which I asked Taichiro to translate for me. And that's how we came across the idea that uh, SL2H was the uh, Lorentz was isomorphic to the Lorentz group in six dimensions. And we sort of played around with that little idea and tried to relate it to, relate it to supersymmetry. So, but the motivations for us essentially were the work that was going on on signal models at the time, and to some extent, superspace formulations of super, of super Yang Mills theories. So we knew that, uh, for example, there was certainly a connection, some connection uh, from sigma models, because if you, have, if you have n equals one sigma model, it, these are all in two dimensions at that time, and they were all parity, there, parity uh, preserving, so they really be n comma n. Uh, so for n equals one, real for n, kala for n equals two, hyperkala for n equals four. And I think there was no mention of n equals eight in those days, because it, it had to be flat. Uh, you couldn't have interactions. But in fact, if you look at the algebra uh, of supersymmetry, that tells you actually the dimension still has to be, even though it's flat, it still has to be a multiple of eight. And um, so, and in addition at that time, there was uh, a formulation of an extended supersymmetry. Uh, Ivanov had written a paper suggesting that somehow that should be, that he connected that with, with quaternions. So, Going from, four, from going from n equals one to n equals two meant going from complex numbers to quaternions. And we were looking at these things and we realized, we thought that, well, the, you, can, you can make the whole thing, the, the commonality in all of them is, the, is seen by going to the maximum space-time dimension permitted by supersymmetry for a given number of supersymmetry charges. And then you see pops out is that that particular, then the dimension those dimensions for which you can have those maximal supersymmetries are always two plus dimension of K. And so this connection of course is supported, you could say expected from the fact that once you know that uh, in, in those dimensions, namely three, four, six, three, well, three, four, six, of course, 10 dimensions we were not able to say much about, but in those cases, at least you have the group SL2K. So we explored a little bit the properties of these spinners in those dimensions and suggested that it was two plus dimension K. Um, because there had been various other suggestions of other kinds of relationships and with other dimensions. Um, and so coming to the, the, this, coming to those, uh, so that's one of the striking sequences of groups that just, that struck us actually looking at this table in this, this uh, Japanese encyclopedia of mathematics. And, but of course, there's the also, what about the SL, what about the D equals 10 case? Because that should somehow be related to octonion. So you would like the special linear group, if you could define it in two, of two by two matrices of the octonions to be somehow equal to spin one nine. Now, if you just look at that, that doesn't look as though it's likely to work because if you just check naively the number of generators you would have, um, for all the other cases, you would say, well, it has, should have four times mentioned K minus one. Uh, basically, you put the determinant to one, real determinant to one, and work out how many generators. So that's the number you should have. But if you 
just put that in for k zo, then you only get 31, which is clearly not the right answer. It should be 45. Now that was taken up later by Sudbury, who did it in a much more sophisticated, much more sophisticated way, when he, when he basically did something mathematical there, whereas we have not even attempted it. And um, and so he was, I think Sudbury initially was discussing it just for, for any orthogonal groups, but he was discussing just the algebra. But the group aspects of them were later uh, elaborated by, I think the first paper on this is a little one known, known one by Tachibana in Emaida, that was already in 89, and the Monogon Shrey. And there's a very relatively recent paper by Vieira on the group representation, octonionic representation uh, of the group SL2O. In any case, uh, what Sudbury noticed was that one of the problems you arise at in, 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 from the naive point, one of the problems of the naive perspective is that if you look at, for example, taking two transformations, if you linearize a set of transformations and then you get a commutator B with X and then you have A commutator with X and you take it the other way around, you don't just get the commutator of A, B with X because there's a, a failure of the Jacobi identity what you get is an extra term, which is an element of G2. And so the idea is that since dimension of G2 has 14, then really you should add 14 to this, this count of the dimension of, of the algebra. And if you do that, then you get 45. I never quite understood where the extra parameters come from because you'd have to provide extra parameters for this term. But in any case, let's call it the add 14 rule. If you do that, you get, you get the right answer there. Um, and there's, there's some mathematical backing for that. So that's a striking sequence. But um, I think the most, but on the other hand, it was a striking sequence, but there was no real connection at this point to, to octonians. I mean, it was, octonians didn't really get in except in this, this kind of suggestive way. I think the way that they first really entered in a, in a, in a more convincing way was in the context of super young Mills theories. Now, Brink and Schwartz and Schirk had already, in fact, back in 1976, constructed super young Mills theories in higher dimensions, but they'd considered the dimensions two, four, six, and 10, not three, four, six, and 10. And in fact, I think at the time that I was looking at this in Japan, I'm not even sure that I knew about Brink, Schwartz, Schwartz, Schwartz and Schirk because 76 was essentially when I finished my PhD. At that point, I didn't know about supersymmetry. So uh, I just started straight in on supergravity. And, and um, I think uh, I probably didn't even know about that paper, even much later on, six years later. But in any case, that was, uh, that was not an impetus in the original uh, ideas about this. But it's, things changed in 84, Green Schwartz revolution. Struperstein revolution. And, and uh, one of their papers, of course, was to find uh, a Lorentz invariant, a covariant uh, formulation for the superstring action. And they pointed out that that works only in three, four, six, and 10 dimensions. Now it's three, four, six, and 10 dimensions, not two. But the point is that they found that exactly the same uh, identity that you need to construct the super Young Mills theory, which is an identity cubic in the uh, in basically, you can view it as a, as a cubic in, in commuting spinners. Um, I'll just call it the cubic identity. Um, so, the, so basically, two was not, was not maximal for, for that amount of supersymmetry because they assumed basically one one. So, they could have it could as well have discussed Brink and Schwartz and Schurk could have already discussed three, four, six, and ten, but they didn't do so. Green and Schwartz, that was for now for three, four, six, and ten. And the first concrete connection to the octonians in the 10-dimensional case, I think, came from a paper by Sierra, it was a little bit of a throwaway remark, but he pointed out that the, in a formulation of the Jordan algebras of three by three matrices, in which basically you focus on the norm, um, it's the formulation due to McCrimmon. So uh, he realized that the, one of the axioms of McCrimmon was essentially this cubic identity. And so, effectively the Jordan identity for three by three emission matrices must be equivalent to this cubic identity. And I think Schrey found more or less the same, the same, same thing in 1994. Um, but as I say, Sierra's comment was, was in fact very, uh, a bit of a throwaway remark and it wasn't really noticed much. But then uh, the next year, Jonathan Evans uh, wrote a very nice uh, paper explicitly on this point and showing that the cubic identity 
this cubic identity um, can be understood as essentially the atoms trialities that uh, are satisfied only for, for the norm division algebra. So it's an alternative way of understanding the norm division algebras. And what Evans did was to show that that alternative way of understanding them is in fact precisely equivalent to finding solutions of this cubic identity. So that, that provided a, a very explicit link to the octonians. But I think even at that point, nobody had actually used the octonians to construct any of these theories. Um, I should also remark, mainly because it has absolutely nothing to do with this talk, that um, supersymmetry ends, at least as far as I know, uh, <clears throat> that it ends, that supersymmetry uh, uh, and um, the norm division algebras come, uh, enter in, in, in various other ways. And one of them is by the magic square, if one starts to look at supergravity theories. So just as another anecdote here, when I got back from Japan and I'd been looking at uh, all these norm division algebras and I decided I'm gonna put that aside and do something completely different. And it seemed that uh, it would be good to look at the geometry associated with coupling five dimensional supergravity to uh, to matter because opposite my office was, was Eugène Cremer, who had, was an expert on five dimensional supergravity. And um, so I got together with Sierra and we worked out a whole bunch of equations related to these couplings. We had them on the board and we're trying to understand what they meant. And Murat Ganaidin, and you just arrived in Paris, came through the door to, to see me. I'd met him previously at CERN and he came through to say hello. He took one look at the board and said, hey, you see, you're working on Jordan algebras. And um, <clears throat> so we said, what? That's not what we thought. But it turned out that uh, indeed we were apparently, and we had again to get back into RCHO and the magic square and some, somehow. I've always thought that should have a relation to all these other relations, but as far as I know, it doesn't. And anyway, let's move on now, because that, as I say, is just uh, something which you has nothing, is not related to what I'm talking about today. Um, now, in uh, Sudbury's paper, he was discussing uh, a lot of these, he was discussing essentially all these isometries and particularly over uh, groups over the reals, complex, quaternions, and octonions, and he, for, for essentially for the orthogonal groups. But of course, that would also include the uh, the conformal groups. And actually, Kugo and I had also looked at the conformal groups. And we'd noticed that, yes, there were some connections. If you looked in six dimensions, there was clearly some quaternions behind spin two six. But it all looked a bit messier in terms of the notation and so on. It, it didn't look quite so pleasing on the page. But Sudbury introduced a new, a new notation because he pointed out essentially that, that um, if you look at the uh, symplectic groups. Normally, in mathematics, they're just defined as the group preserving an antisymmetric matrix. Uh, even if you look over the complex numbers, you still keep with an antisymmetric matrix. Now, in the case of, in the cases, if you're looking at uh, basically uh, symmetric forms, the natural generalization of a symmetric form over the reals is not a symmetric form over the complex numbers, but a Hermitian form over the quadratic, over the complex numbers. And at least in the context of physics, that's usually the case. That's usually the natural thing to do. So he said, well, the natural thing to consider is not an antisymmetric matrix over the complex numbers, but a skew emission matrix, a skew emission, excuse me, quadratic form over the, uh, over the complex numbers. And more generally, let's consider skew emission quadratic forms over reals, complex, quaternions, and octonions. Now, if you do that, and his notation for that was to put a dagger. Now, if you do that, it does now look very pleasing to the eye again, because actually, of course, the symplectic group of four over the complex numbers, well, that's, of course, now this is the, the unitary, standard unitary thing, but that's a well-known U, U44. Um, but that, uh, excuse me, the, uh, that's, yeah, uh, but that's just the, the four-dimensional conformal group basically because the difference between emission and anti-emission over the complex numbers is just multiplying by i. So if you're looking, you're trying to preserve a skew emission, that's the same as preserving emission essentially. Um, in six dimensional cases, uh, sp4 over the, over the, over the uh, 
quaternions is spin 2, 6. So essentially, we've, by going to the quaternions, we've essentially replaced orthogonal groups by symplectic groups. Um, and then the 10 dimensional case is one that uh, Sudbury discussed in much more detail later uh, as the conformal group. Um, and notice that again, there's a U1 factor that appears in the four dimensional case. And uh, notice that also for, except for the octonian case, if you work out the dimension of these groups, uh, you just get, by looking at just at the matrices, number of independent uh, components, you just get six dimension K plus four. But that's, if you apply that to the octonians, that's six times eight plus four, which is 52, which is not the right number. But if you just add 14, you get uh, 66, which is, which is the right number, the add 14 rule. Of course, you can apply the same kind of logic to uh, rotation subgroups. Sudbury didn't do this, but if you just simply apply, you can just view a unitary group as an SO dagger group. Um, and you can apply that to the rotation groups in, in three, four, six, and 10 dimensions. And again, you get a nice looking sequence. So for example, in six dimensions, the rotation group in six dimensions is just SO dagger two over the quaternions, which is SP two, which is spin five. And um, then you can also look at the uh, octonionic case. And I suppose Sudbury was looking at that one too. Um, and notice again that there's a, there's a U1 factor that always appears in the four dimensional case. So, and again, of course, if you look at the dimensions of these things, then naively uh, you come to the conclusion that the dimension of those groups would be three times the dimension of K minus two. Um, if you add that all up, you get the wrong number, but if you add 14, uh, for, for, you get the wrong number for the Octonians, but if you add 14, you get 36, which is, which is the dimension of spin nine. Um, so that works again. Now, as part of this, uh, let me, uh, a little, this kind of a survey of, of some of these ideas, just, I'd like to make a digression now, just into string N theory, because I've been applying this, you've been basically looking at these kind of sequences in the context of space-time dimensions of three, four, six, and 10. But of course, you can also apply that instead of the space-time Instead of it being a space-time dimension, you can also think of it as a world volume dimension. So in the context of brains, um, if you look at the planar static M2, D3, M5 brains of string M theory, which are picked out for you know, a special in various ways. Um, so but one, of the, is the, one of them is that they yield maximally supersymmetric field theories with the conformal theories. Uh, uh, on a Minkowski world volume of dimension three, four, and six. And you can include 10, actually, if you count, you can think of the, the if you take the harava witten uh, boundary, 11 boundary of 11 dimensional space time, which is a 10 dimensional Minkowski space time on which for, per, because of uh, the necessity to cancel some anomalies, you get an E8 gauge theory. Um, which in, in itself indicates uh, quaternions should play a role in some way. It, so if you, you, if you consider that as a nine brain, you can, you can in include that as well. And indeed you can, it's for many purposes, you can, many other purposes, you can actually think of it as an M9, as a nine brain. So let's do that. Now, um, of course, one of the things, that, one of the reasons that these are particular brains are special is essentially because their field theories are, uh, can be conformal invariant, at least the free field theories are conformal invariant. And if you uh, view them as sources for a super corresponding supergravity solution, then near the horizon, you get an eight, this ADS cross S type of geometry. And then you can look at the sequences of super isometry groups. And if you do that, and so this uh, was done in a relatively recent paper, if you look at that, then you get some, indeed another nice sequence, the OSP group for the three dimension, and in the four dimensional case, which is, S, which is the U unitary again, but that's S, same as OSP dagger. And then the six dimensional case is again OSP dagger two. And of course, what happens is that the numbers on the right are four always, but OSP basically the O part, the first role is giving you the number of supersymmetries, but counted as independent spinners. But of course, since the dimension of the spinner is increasing at the same time, in order to keep the number of supersymmetries at 32, you have to decrease that number from eight to four to two. And then if you would go to the next one in the sequence to 10, 
you would say, well, we should have some kind of OSP dagger one slash four over the Octonians. Can that play the same role? Now, strangely enough, there is a paper, in fact, uh, in 1984, which I literally didn't know about until 2017, uh, by Hasibets and Lukievsky, who tried to attempt, attempt to interpret precisely this group. group. I mean, uh, I, group is, I should put in, in some scare quotes, but they, they as, as a, well, actually, they discuss most of the algebra as a D equals 11 to sitter like algebra. So I don't know, I personally haven't been able to make much sense of their paper, but there it is. Um, okay, so that's a little bit of the history uh, towards this connection between the dimension of space time and the norm division algebras. Now, just let's look at that, put supersymmetry aside just for the moment um, and just say, well, how can you, all everything I've discussed up to now would be, okay, there's some, there, there are these norm division algebras which play some role, but if they really are important, surely we'd be able to construct the theories in terms of these, these division algebras. Shouldn't we, we be able to do that? Well, let's see how far you can get on that. The first thing you would like to know is, well, what about the point in space-time? How can you write that as in terms of a real complex, in terms of real complex quaternions or octonions? Well, of course, that's well known. Uh, if you look at a two by two emission matrix over the real complex quaternions or octonions, that's equivalent to a point in a Minkowski space-time at dimension three, four, six, and 10. And the parameterization is basically this light-like parameterization where this bold face X is the transverse space dimension as, an, as an, just an element of this uh, norm division algebra. And you have a natural transformation, Lorentz transformations on that, which acts in this particular way. So L is an element of SL2K, and you define it by this relation here. It's not actually the determinant of L, because that's not defined generally over us. It's defined for the reals and complex numbers, but not for the uh, quaternions or the octonions. But, uh, but it's, it's defined if you, if you take LL dagger, then that's omission. So then the determinant is defined over the quaternions and even for the octonions provide they're only two by two or three by three matrices, uh, which is the case here, of course, two by two. So that's defined, that defines that, that group and you get an action from L from the left and L dagger from the right. Um, and that's, that's a vector. Now, if you want a co-vector, then basically we had a different transformation. Um, and if you wanted, you might, we're essentially going from one to the other, it's like we would say, you know, pushing up an index up or down. And if you want to know how that works, in, if you've written them in this two by two uh, notation, then it's the same as trace, whoops, excuse me, it's the same as trace reversal, as pointed out by Shrey. So if emission M is a vector, then you, if you remove the trace, Remember, so if I take the trace of M tilde, I get trace of M minus twice the trace of M. So it becomes minus the trace of M. Uh, so they have opposite traces. That's, uh, then that's a covector. And if you take covector for covector, you get back to a vector. And if you take the product of a vector with a covector, you actually get the determinant times the identity. So those are all useful relations in trying to write down things work directly with, with these matrices. So in the context of particle mechanics, it's actually fairly straightforward to, to do that. You can really write things down in those dimensions using these matrices. So for example, a particle of mass M in three, four, six, and 10, it can be simply written like in this way, uh, relativistic particle reparameterization invariant. So you simply have a mass shell condition uh, and debt P is essentially proportional to P squared. Actually, probably I should have debt P is M squared to some power, in fact, because for the three dimensional, for the six dimensional case, it's, it would be M squared or squared, I think. But anyway, I'll, uh, minor, minor mistake there. So in the case, of course, if you want to, now the whole point here in some sense is the connection with supersymmetry. So uh, if you wanted to get supersymmetry into it, what you have to do, so the standard for the standard way of doing this, as is, is pointed out by Castle, Buoni, Brink, and Schwartz, uh, is you simply replace dx by a Lorentz uh, invariant form, dx is theta d theta, et cetera, and that is uh, left invariant under, under uh, Lorentz transformations. 
uh, excuse me, it's, uh, and not Lorentz, it's left invariant under, uh, su under supersymmetry transformation. In fact, super, super translations, not under a Lorentz transformation, of course, but it transforms just as, in the same way as a vector. Uh, and you have to do that, of course, for a Grassmann odd SL2K spinner. So now spinner will be just two components, but each component is an element of K. So for example, over the octonians, that's uh, 16 real components altogether, which is indeed the number of components of a, of a minimal uh, chiral spinner in 10 dimensions. Um, now, of course, this is rather straightforward if it's, uh, if it's just real and uh, complex numbers. The quaternionic case is a bit more complicated, um, but actually was, uh, was written down for the, the superparticle in a paper of 1988 by Kimura Onoda. And in fact, they then went on with Nakamura to do the same thing for the octonians. So they actually write the superparticle explicitly using uh, octonians. Uh, that appears in, in their paper of uh, 1988. Um, and I think also in, uh, in uh, Schrader it later in 1994. And uh, one of the nice things about Schrader's paper is he found a simple presentation of the cubic identity, which is discussed uh, further in Baez and uh, Huerta. Um, and I think it's called the, uh, they call it, maybe Schrey also called it the, the psi cubed identity or something like that. Anyway, we'll be using this cubic identity at various points later on. Um, because it's, uh, I'm going to be coming shortly to go, go, coming back to the Maxwell, to the Yang Mills case in a moment, or rather the Maxwell. So let's, but he, we're carrying on here with, uh, with, uh, with just the particle. So uh, one thing you might want to do for the particle is to, if I go back here, is in the massless case, at any rate, you, you get the determinant of P is equal to zero. So one thing you might want to do is to solve that. Now, there's a, the nice way of solving it in terms of a, of a SL2K spinner, because if, um, so determinant of P has to be zero. So if you write P out as UU dagger, as, as, as in terms of spinners, then you'd need UU dagger plus other similar terms. You need at least two such terms to get a non-zero determinant. If you just have one, then essentially it's, it's singular. And so the determinant is equal to zero. So you can solve the constraint, the mass shell constraint in this case, simply in terms of a single spinner. Um, and um, now, whereas uh, U on the other hand, of course, you realize that U has, has basically, its number of components is two times the dimension of, of the uh, algebra K. Uh, whereas the null vector P has only d minus one is dim k plus one. So um, now that more coincides essentially in three dimensions, but in high in the other dimensions, it doesn't. There, there are more components of u than appear, actually appear in p. And so there's a gauge transformation. And that's, that gauge transformation is in fact right multiplication by unit norm element of k. So actually that gives you a z2 group in three dimensions, but then otherwise you get u1, su2, and then if you go to the octonionic case, you get O7. S7 isn't a group, or is it? Well, according to Sonius, it's a soft group. And C will wrote, wrote a, another paper sort of exploring these kinds of things. You get structure constants, which are not strictly constant, but vary where you are on the seven sphere. Um, at any rate, um, I leave that there for the moment, but we're going to come back to similar similar issues in a moment. Let me just point out here, of course, if, the, if you have a massive particle, then essentially you, instead of having a single spinner U, you have a pair of them. So it's U, U, or you just write it as U, U dagger, where you have an, now an invertible matrix U. And now the gauge invariance is just, essentially you have Lorentz from the left and acting from the right, you have this uh, rotation groups. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so now I want to come back to the point of looking at massless particles and thinking about massless particles, one is led to the idea of the celestial sphere uh, because that's essentially the celestial sphere is, is as the name suggests, you have light rays coming from any direction in space. And that's just the two sphere you see the stars essentially uh, appear as if they're on this uh, celestial sphere. 
So um, the idea is to, now there are various ways to do this, but if what we want to do, what we're aiming to do here is to find a Lorentz invariant way of integrating quantities over the, over the uh, celestial sphere. And the most systematic way of doing that is to think of the celest these celestial spheres as coset spaces of the Lorentz group, which in this case is SL2K. But you can do this, you can do that, you can start that procedure for any space time dimension. So the idea is you take the Lorentz algebra, spin one D minus one, and you decompose it with respect to the transverse rotation. Um, essentially, this is, the this is the isotropy group of a light-like ve light -like vector. Uh, and so that preserves uh, a rotate, the isotropy group preserves, a, so that's a transverse rotations, but there's also a SO11 factor. But if you, there's a decomposition of the group itself, which breaks into the weights of the various generators under SO11. So there's a bunch that have negative weight. That's actually a D minus two vector. They're both D minus two vectors. One has negative weight and one has positive weight. And they're essentially raising lowering operators for this SO11 weight. And if you take just the algebra of H0 and the positive weights, then that generates a maximal, maximal uh, subalgebra, so the maximal parabolic, uh, or Bor Borel. Well, I think Borel isn't strictly correct, but in any case, sometimes called Borel subgroup uh, of this uh, Lorentz group. And so if you take the coset space, if you basically divide out the Lorentz group by that subgroup, you get a compact space of dimension, which is exactly the right dimension, is that dimension, uh, dimension of K. So it's, the, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sphere. So it's a D binds two dimensional sphere. Uh, and that's the coset space. Um, and this, this idea was developed in 91 by Galperin, Howe, and Stell. And so uh, at, the, at the level of the group, of course, so you have you basically, you, you divide out by the group. So that's this, this group here, and then it's a semi-direct product with this H plus part. And the point is that now that's an in general dimension, but in three, four, six, and 10 dimensions, again, so there's, it's special because you can write an element of the Lorentz group as a pair of spinners, as just, uh, well, rather similar to what we've been doing for the moment. And you can th just think of it for the moment as these again, two component spinners over reals, complex quaternions and, or and octonions. Now, I'm just gonna, the octonionic case, you could say, wait a minute, does it work for the octonions? But let's just put aside those issues for the octonions for the moment, just to get the idea. In fact, I'll be doing something a little bit different when we come to the octonions later on. Um, <clears throat> but the, that's the basic idea. And so you have U plus, U minus, um, which gives you L dagger minus one is some other spinners, plus or minus the index down means it has negative weight now, the opposite to the U's. And so the, the weight, the positive weight ones are U plus and V minus, and the others all have negative weight. Now, the point is here is that if you're trying to construct, now the point is, is that the celestial sphere, uh, essentially you're dividing out by all of the parameters contained in this group. So you don't want to have you can't use, you can't parameterize the celestial sphere with any spinner which, be, which has a non-zero transformation under this H plus part. Now, the only ones which are inert under H plus are precisely the spinners of positive weight. So those are the only ones you can use. And what you need to do now is you'd, li you'd like to construct uh, a, 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 some kind of weight. So you start by looking at one forms. Um, you need, of course, a, D minus two form ultimately, but let's construct them from some one forms. And you'd like them to be inert under this subgroup. For example, what about the, the you know, you'd like it to be H plus inert. Um, and, and so you must use these positive weight ones, but you'd also like it to be invari invariant under the SOD minus two as well. Well, you can do that by, because of this identity here, you can do that by constructing this one form W plus plus, which as you see has Wait, oh, that dagger should be a plus, not a, oh, no, no, the, the minus is down below, that's correct. So that has weight, weight two. Now you cannot construct a measure, so that actually is invariant under, under the whole Borel subgroup except for the weight. And you cannot find one of non-zero weight, of zero weight, 
because you can only use things which have positive weight. So that's really the best you can do. Now you have to buy it. Now you have to multiply some number of them together to get a, a measure on the d minus two sphere. And so you get some kind of measure on the celestial sphere this way. Uh, and the point is, it has it has dimension. If you work it out, it simply has. You see, this has dimension. This is weight two. So the weight the weight on the celestial two on celest, celestial um, sphere in dimension d dimensions will be two dim k. Uh, so you get so so. In other words, the uh, the measure isn't completely invariant. But of course, if you integrate it over something which has a weight which cancels the weight of the measure, then you get an invariant. So the the integrand has to have minus dimension, has the weight of minus dimension k. And some of these constructions of integrations were mentioned, were worked out by Del Galper and Sokja in a paper of 92. Uh, and there's a simplification that occurs in three and four dimensions because then these spinners u plus and v minus, they're actually in equivalent Lorentz representations. So you can, you can do it without ever thinking about the v's. Now in the six and 10 dimensions, that's not the case because the u's will have positive chirality and the v's will have negative chirality and you can't, you can't go from one to the other. There's, they're, they're inequivalent Lorentz representations. So you need to do something a little bit different in the six and 10 cases. And that's one of the complications that prevented sort of progress prior to this, this work. Now, um, I should just mention before going on here that you can see already from this that the celestial spheres are projective lines because this uh, Borel subgroup acts on U plus as if I'm now, well, of course it's invariant under U H plus, but so the only thing left is the SOD minus two, which is, which is essentially action by a, uh, an element of K of unit norm, but you're also multiplying by a positive, you're also multiplying by just some positive element. So essentially you get multiplication by right, right multiplication by a non-zero element of K. So that's how this acts. And you're basically dividing out by that. So that tells us that, uh, that the celestial sphere, SL2K over HB is actually the uh, uh, projective, projective line, KP1. And a well-known fact, of course. So now let's do this. So I want to come back and use this to do this, but let's just look, let's sort of go back, pretend we didn't, pretend I did, hadn't told you any of that now. And you're just looking at the simplest case. You're looking at the three-dimensional wave equation, and you're wondering how how can I solve this equation? Well, you say, let's see. I do a Fourier transform. So I write it as I write phi of x as e to the i p dot x, some some function of p. And well, if I put in a delta p squared there, then automatically that will solve the wave equation because I take box on this, I'll get a p squared, but that's zero because of delta p squared. Well, I mean, the point is that p squared is equal to zero, but the only contribution is in fact from the point where p squared is equal. It's the only contribution is from where p squared is equal to zero, therefore the integral is zero. Uh, okay, you can simply solve, do, work, write p out and solve for p zero and write it in this way. And now we, what we can do is let's set p as some factor times u bar plus gamma u plus. Now, the reason I'm not writing this as p is u bar u gamma u, basically, by putting in the omega factor, is because I want p to be inert under, I want p is inert, p didn't, we didn't know about these, this uh, SO11 weight when you write down the momentum. So we, we would like the omega factor to cancel out the weight of the u, so actually it has to have negative weight too. So I put that omega in there and I just calculate dp1 wedge dp2 and I get this, um, because you notice that P zero is directly related to U, 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 U transpose gamma, U transpose U. And so I get uh, this relation here. And then I, I realize, ah, I have my measure here. That's a D mu. That's my measure D mu. And then this factor here is just my integrand. And what's it depend on? Well, notice that when I put in a P dot X here, I'm contracting with the P, which is now this, I'm contracting an X. So I get an omega and then I get X contracted with this. So here it is, I'm, that's, I'm using Feynman's notation x slash. I'm just calling that u pl x plus plus. So what I get here is e to the i omega x plus plus. This is the general p, but p depends on basically omega and u plus. Um, and of course, then I get an x plus plus dependence through there. 
So if I do this integral, and you can easily see by construction that when I scale under this scaling of u, omega scales as uh, minus two. And so this, this in fact scales as minus two. It has the correct weight to be an integrand to give you, uh, this has weight two. It's an integrand of weight minus two. Hence, you get something invariant. That's a solution. And you can check that it's a solution because if you take box of this, you bring down each time you get a derivative with respect to x plus plus because x only appears through, through this quantity here. That gives you a u dagger, u plus gamma u. Uh, maybe there's a bar there missing. Um, and uh, well, that square is null because that's a null vector. So now I'm using the fact that u bar gamma u is null. That's basically the three dimensional case of what I said before, that this big u, plus, u dagger u of the, uh, is, 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 uh, is, is, has a unit de zero determinant. Um, okay, so now that's straight. That's a straightforward way of solving the three-dimensional equation, and you see that you basically get it in precisely the form that, that we've been heading towards previously. Let's do the same for four dimensions. Well, now if you look for a positive energy solution to the wave equation, you can do exactly the same, and you now end up with uh, 5x is d mu. Now the, me the measure d mu is now uh, something which has weight minus 4 because you have to this is complex, you have to get it to read real, so you have to take the complex conjugate. So now you get a, now you get a, a two form, which you of course need because you were integrating over S2. And again, it depends on this X plus plus, X plus plus now is defined in the analogous way. And of course, over the U plus, which are now complex two component bile spinners. Um, and the integrand also has weight minus four, uh, which of course it must. Now, you can, and so it's, if I write it out in terms of the components, if I just define a complex number, which is u2 over u1, and remember that's essentially, that's essentially a coordinate on the celestial sphere, which is the Riemann sphere now. Um, then this measure is just simply a measure of the Riemann sphere times something which has zero weight because I've absorbed this into the definition here of z. So, oh, sorry, that gets, this gets absorbed into the little f. So I get a capital F, which now this has zero weight. So now you have basically this integral over the Riemann sphere of something which is zero weight. And the point is that S2 is a symplectic manifold. So you can now use the, uh, this Duisam and Heckman theorem. You can localize all contributions to points on S2. And then you can express uh, those integrals. You can express those contribution from points on S2 as contour integrals around those points on the celestial sphere. And if you do that, you now have Penrose's twister transform solution. And uh, so in other words, you can view the twister Penrose's twister transform idea as basically in two, two steps. One step is what I've described previously, which goes through, in fact, for reals, complex, protonians, and octonians. And well, actually, um, I should say it's really three steps, isn't it? Because the, the second step is is isolating it to contributions on a symplectic manifold, which S2 is, S1 isn't, uh, but of course S4 and S8 are, at least I think they are. Um, so uh, uh, in principle, you could do that step also, but the next step, of course, contour integrals, then you need the, uh, uh, well, you need the, you need the whole, com you need the whole paraphernalia of complex analysis, at least I presume you do. Um, Okay, but now what I'm interested in, I want to go back to put in the supersymmetry here. Um, so let's try and solve the 3D Maxwell equations. Uh, okay, now they're superfield equations and there's a simple superfield equation. I'm not going to write down the super space stuff, but I just give you the commutator of covariant, anti-commutator of covariant derivatives, it contains all the same information. You solve it in exactly the same way. Now I'm doing Maxwell. So now, as you, so basically I'm not considering, this is not a scalar, it's a spinner. So I have to put in one of these spinners here. Fine. Now I get a, a, a something which is essentially a world line superfield. has something which I can interpret as time. And then you get some, some extra anti-commuting variables, which are just obtained just by contraction with the U's. So, um, and now what you find, and of course this has to, has to have world line weight three. If you just take, if you just look at this, work it out, you get this term here, and that's equal to zero because the user anti-commuting, a user commuting, excuse me, 
but I'm contracting with an epsilon alpha beta. So it works, you've solved the equation. Let's move on to four-dimensional supermaxima. Okay, you have exactly the same equation, but now it's for an anti-commuting complex spiral spinner superfield. So you can do exactly the same thing. Now the only difference is that, uh, well, x plus plus is again that complex defined as, as we did it before. But then theta plus is now, you get a theta plus and you get a theta bar plus, of course. And of course, I should have put in here this, well, and, and there should be a comma there, that's a u plus as well. But so now it's an n equals two world line superfield. Now it has, it has to have weight minus five. However, it's now constrained. The point is there's now another, there's a constraint, which is this, I should have said, excuse me, I actually missed a point here. This has to be a complex vial spinner chiral superfield. Excuse me, otherwise it's not the right equation. So actually what you must impose is the chirality condition on this superfield, which means that this has to be zero. But you put that through here and you see by looking at this that actually you need a corresponding chirality constraint on the world line, n equals two world line superfield in order to get a solution of the 4D Maxwell equations. Yeah, I should have put chiral up there. Uh, okay, so let's go on now because let's look at the six dimensional case. Now in principle, you could do the whole thing here over the quaternions, but that gets more complicated for the 10 dimensional case. And even for the six dimensional case, it's simpler really to use the fact that the SL2H is, is, is isomorphic to SU star four, which is basically a double cover of SO, SO15. And so you're essentially replacing these two, two component spinners by four component chiral symplectic spinners, and that which means that they have a basically an additional, additional SU2 index on them. And in fact, separate SU2 indices. There's another index here, A equals one to two, and another index there. So there are now two SU2 factors, which of course was the automorphisms of the, of the quaternions. Pardon me, uh, Paul, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, what is SU star for? Sorry, what is the star there? Oh, well, star, um, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I forget the precise, I forget the precise definition in terms of quaternions. It's a quaternionic realization of, of, of the group. So it involves the quaternions. Um, of, of the group SU4. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, it's, okay. it's, it's explained. So it's basically, in, uh, I should basically read SU4 there, but there's some. Yeah, there's some yeah, tech yeah, that's, yeah, you can just, that's right. Okay, thank you. You can read it as spin 1-5, actually. So it's spin 1-5. The double cover, yeah. But it's nice because if you know that SU, because, but the point is that the construction that gives you S star four is a quaternionic construction. So it's mm -hmm. nice to think of it like okay, that. Okay, it's a, like a quaternion. Yeah, it's, it's of... explained in that uh, book by Gilmore. I mean, as I remember where I read about that first of all. Okay, thank you. Um, so you now for these four component spinners. Now, so the 60 anti, so the 60 Maxwell chiral spinner superfield now is an, it's an anti chiral super spinner. Field. And it's, it's again satisfies, it satisfies a relation here uh, plus another one. So, in, so there's this condition and this is like the chirality condition again. Um, so you can, solve the, the, you can solve the first equation by simply writing this down as we, now I have to use this V's because I have to use an anti-chiral spinner. And you see now this thing gets, a, gets an SU2 index on it, but there's also an index here. So they're really, three SU2s going into the game here. There's the two A's, but there's the I index here, the so-called pauli gosset SU2. Really, a tri you know, the triality of the three SU2s. Um, and so you see there are basically four components of this, uh, of this world line superfield, but also what, what is theta plus? It actually has component IA, four of them as well. So you now have an SU2 cross SU2 vector N equals four world line superfield weight minus nine. And you want to solve, um, you want to solve the, uh, I can't read my own slide on here because, oh yeah, this is right, yes. Uh, so we want to solve the, the, other, the other super space constraint. But if you work out what that implies, you discover that it implies this constraint on the world line super field. And now there are four components uh, of a psi, and there are four super covariant derivatives. So you can, 
actually write them in terms of, you can write them basically in terms of quaternions. Here I've done it in terms of just triplets of Pauli matrices, because basically the way you go from just using the Pauli, because that's essentially going from quaternions to this SU star four is really like realizing the, realizing the Pauli matrix, realizing the quaternions as Pauli matrices. Um, and um, if you rewrite that in terms of octonions, then you discover that these condition two, two prime actually boils down to this condition here, which is a generalization of the, you see, this is a triplet of conditions. If you have only a single complex, uh, if you have only a single um, imaginary unit I, then of course, this is just the chirality condition for, uh, for a complex superfield of you know, n, n equals two complex superfield. And uh, so this is the way you generalize that to the quaternions. Now, I'm, uh, you'll be glad to hear that I'm nearing the end now, because basically what I want to do, we want to do is next go next to the 10 dimensional case. Um, okay, now, um, I first of all actually have to discuss some preliminaries. So, so basically, as in the as in the six-dimensional case, there, what I'm going to do is to uh, not use the uh, not use those octonionic spinners, but essentially use the fact that it's spin one d minus one, and you can write an element of the Lorentz group in this case as L alpha a. Now, the point here is that you need if to write another. You see, a, a alpha has sixteen components. Now we have sixteen component spinners. So if you write it as u plus u minus, each of those has to be an eight plan. And in fact, you take it to be an, an, uh, basically the spinner representation of the rot of the SO8, uh, the spin eight transverse rotation group, and that's the conjugate spinner. And then similarly for the L to the minus one, they're real, so you take transpose. Um, so you basically separate it into two spin eight, eight plans of opposite chirality. They also have opposite SO1 weight. And you basically go through the same construction as before. You can only use the positive weight spinners. And to cut a long story short, you get yourself your uh, measure that way. Now, then you're looking to solve, the, solve some sort of massless wave equation. And in order to do that, it's essential that the 10 vector u plus a gamma u plus a is null. Now, that's summed on a. Now, there's, we know that if you just take a single u, u gamma u in 10 dimensions, that is going to be a null, null uh, 10 vector. That's basically the point I said before, like if you write momentum as u dagger u over the quaternionic, uh, for quaternionic spinners, that, that essentially has determinant zero. So therefore p squared is zero, so it's null. But if you, this is certainly not null in general, but the point is that these spinners, because of the whole construction, uh, because this has to be an element of spin one nine, they, they're actually constrained and they're constrained by a relation which is given by this. And so as a result of this relation here, constraint, in fact, e even if you sum on those indices, you still get a null 10 vector. Okay, now using that fact, and then we can move on. Um, oops. Uh, we can solve the uh, 10 dimensional super maximal. So again, there are two equations you have to solve. One is this one here, which it basically gives you the, the um, I mean, that's what's sort of containing the dynamics. And there's another one here too, which is essentially putting some constraints. Um, now you can solve, so if you only put this, yeah, so if you, well, you, of course in 10 dimensions, you can't really separate out the dynamic, dynamic the, you can't really separate out the constraints and dynamical and non-dynamical non ones. But, Anyway, so that's roughly the idea. Uh, then you can solve the first one exactly as before in the same way. But now what happens, of course, you see your world line superfield is now an eight plat of them. And your, your, your anti-commuting variable, so your, your world line superspace also has uh, eight fermions. So you have an eight plat of n equals eight world line superfields. And to cut a long story short, you can rewrite the condition that you get on a psi in exactly, exactly the same way, but involving a lot more work. You can rewrite it basically, but you can introduce super covariant derivative, octonionic super covariant derivatives, and you can introduce an octonionic valued superfield. And you can rewrite these condition two 
two prime, really, I should say now. Uh, didn't I get two prime somewhere? I thought I had a slide where I had two prime on it, but I think that maybe. Actually, I'm not. I mean, it's when I have, yeah, um, I should tell. Let, um, I'm un actually unable to move my slides when somebody is trying to be removed from or taken. There's, I set to some sort of slide missing here, but uh, but uh, I don't have two prime. Anyway, it's here. It is. I'm there. It's imposed by basically you get this condition here, and that's an octonionic analog of the n equals two chirality condition. So the upshot is that. If you're looking at solving the super Maxwell equations uh, over the real uh, in the three, four, six, and ten dimensions, there's an explicit connection to uh, to the real complex Octonians or Octonians through this twist-like transform. Um, now, the fact that you the they should you might have thought, well, isn't that a bit surprising? Because we needed the cubic identity previously for the Yang Mills. When you put in the interactions, then you need the cubic identity to show you've got supersymmetry. But actually, as Jonathan Evans points out in his paper, it, it's a bit of a throwaway remark, but he points out that actually you already need the, this cubic identity before you look at the interactions because the supersymmetry algebra will not close in the three, four, six, and 10 dimensions, even for the Maxwell case, unless you have that cubic identity is satisfied. So we actually already knew from that that the, 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 these, these norm division algebras had to play a role already in the Maxwell case. And you can see that the way that they appear in the super, this, I should say in the super space formulation, what happens is in some sense, you forced the algebra to work. And since you're forcing the algebra to work, that means that the, somehow the, the, the norm division algebras must enter into the calculation in another way. And this is how they enter into the calculation. They enter into it by a condition, which is essentially the K chirality condition. Um, okay, that gets to the, basically where I wanted to be. At the end of this, to what I wanted to tell you, um, I'm just move on to the last transparency, which is just, I was going to sort of try and sum it up, but in the end, when I was trying to write this transparency, I just had some final thoughts. I thought, let me put those down. Um, so basically, you can see that to some extent, I've discussed uh, Yang Mills and, and, and field theories. But I've also discussed superparticles. And the two are, of course, related by this twister-like transform. I've actually got the came looking at essentially world-line superfields from the point starting from the field theory, the free field equations, trying to solve them. But you can go back the other way. You can try to start from world-line superfield, a superparticle quantized, and sort of derive the field equations. And I think there should be some sort of two-way street on this, but there's only a very little is known about that. Um, but to some extent, some aspects of that were done in this one of those other papers by Del Duke and Company that I mentioned. But in any case, the point is you have superparticle in target space two plus target space two plus k dimensions. The number of world-line supersymmetry charges is the dimension of k. That's one, two, four, and eight. But the number of Susie charges of the field theory. Uh, is actually twice that. Because if you start thinking about just already in three dimensions, a spinner has two components. So you have to multiply by two. So actually it's two times the dimension of K. But those field theories, right, describe fluctuations of some of them, those field theories on BPS brains of world, world, world volume dimensions of precisely two plus dimension K, but now interpreted as a world volume. And those are sources in supergravity theories, which the number of supersymmetry charges is twice as big because they are, after all, BPS brains break half the supersymmetry. So we get we go from a particle to some field theory to supergravity, which you can view maybe as effective theories for string M theory, etc. Um, in each case, we're doubling the number of supersymmetries from one two four eight to two four eight sixteen to four. Well, anyway, double that. So at k equals o, then for the octonionic case, you then get 32 supersymmetry charges. So I, uh, you know, that perhaps is a way forward to getting octonions into string m theory, and then ultimately as a way of getting the octonions into whatever you get from those theories in the higher dimensions by compact compactification down to the standard model. As you can see from this talk, I have interpreted and in the 
title of the workshop, Onctonians and Standard Model. I've interpreted that and as a union and not as an intersection. But of course, one would like there to be an intersection. Uh, and this is the best I can do for a possible intersection. So I thought I should end on something that would even give some kind of optimism for an intersection with what I'm sure other people will talk about on a standard model, which will have apparently no relation to any of this stuff. But maybe at the end of the day, it will have a relation. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And I've just gone a little bit over time, I think. Great. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. There were some questions in the chat. Uh, I think John Huerta had a question. John, do you want to ask it yourself or you want me to read it? Sure, sure, I can ask it. My, my question was, are any of these OSP supergroups that you, um, that were the super isometry groups of certain spaces, are any of them uh, super conformal symmetry groups, I think? Well, yeah, I mean, they are, I, I, I was, I was raising them actually as in the context of basically anti de sitter, you know, but of course that's the same as super conformal in one dimension lower. So yes, in, in three, four, six and 10 dimensions, they are really super conformal. Uh, oh, well, it was up here, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, I, I've, uh, I, you know, I could have, I could have, I could have just said super conformal <coughs> and avoided the, uh, uh, yeah, but I wanted to do it. Well, I want to do it this way because because this was the way I actually, you know, that's, that's how I discovered some of this stuff here. I mean, that's how I came across this article by Hasiel Lukieski. It's also how we came about uh, with my um, co-authors here. That's how we, we kind of came about this, this thing. But yes, of course, you, you could think of it just as well. They're, of course, they're connected, ADS, CFT. So, I mean, it's the same, right? That's, uh, I just wanted to make the presentation in this in this way that gave some more optimism towards a connection between two string and M theory. But, but also about those groups, are they, um, can you think of the ADS cross S geometries as being homogeneous spaces for these? Uh, uh, well, you, yeah, I mean, you can, you can actually, well, you can give an explicit, in fact, what we did in, in the paper was essentially to write down an explicit formulation of the super particle, in fact, in twisted type variables. So it ends up, and, and so it's, it's literally everything is written in terms of quaternions, you know, of real complex numbers or quaternions for these particular cases. And it's a very simple action, which is in which these symmetries are manifest, basically. It's, it's a simple, you, you just, it's essentially the fundamental representation of these groups, you know, with, well, the supergroups is, are the variables of the super particle in a twister-like formulation. Right. So all those symmetries are completely manifest once you do it in this way. So I think it was something like a, I forget what it was, a, it had twister-like or twister type in the, in the title. I forget the title of the paper, but um, something like that. But yeah, we, we did that. Now, uh, beyond that, um, we didn't do anything beyond that, but I think I think that does to some extent answer your question because the variables are precisely, you know, there is a, basically is a linear action of these groups yeah. on, on the variables of the model. So it's, it's simply manifestly invariant under, under, under these, these groups. And that, Whereas uh, we started with, we started with, we started, that's what we started with. We started with the super particle in the ADS cross S background. Right. Written in terms of X's and P's, but in this, but not in a flat background, but in this ADS cross S background. And starting with that, then sort of introducing some, you know, solving for P's and so on, in the way I was describing, introducing these, the other variables, you get exactly, basically, as a fun, everything is determined in terms of a fundamental representation of one of these groups. And so, of course, we didn't do the octonionic case, um, but we were, of course, uh, interested in what would, could we do and what would it mean? But, um, one would have to make sense of. I should say that the way that this this paper of Hasiewicz and Lukieski goes about is at some point they use this idea that S seven is a soft group, and so it's it's in the same spirit as that kind of stuff. Um, but whether or not that helps, I don't know. There was also was a comment from Leron. Uh, Leron, do you want to elaborate on your comment? 
Sorry, say again. There was a comment from uh, Levon Borstein uh, in the chat. Oh, if, if he's oh so in the chat. chat. Sorry, I, I, chat. I don't see yeah. a chat. I mean, uh, Leon, are you still here? Do you want to elaborate on it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, fine. What, what is the comment? Well, can I, if maybe if I, I've got full screen. If I don't have full screen, maybe I get comments. I don't know. Um, it looks like, it looks like he has left, I think. He has left. Okay. Then it's. Yeah, he and I were chatting a bit. He said that he had to run and. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Childcare. Well, yeah, I, sorry, I went. I went a few minutes. Maybe only time. himself can make sense of this comment, so we would need him to explain what his comment meant. Anyway, uh, I also have one question. Yeah. Uh, you didn't mention um, hope vibrations, right? For any of the case, uh, the, any of the division algebras, there is a corresponding hope vibration. Yeah. And their bases are celestial spheres. Yeah. So, do you have any comments on this? Do they fit into the story? Do they play any role? Um, I don't have any comments, but I'm pretty sure that they did enter in, but maybe not in an essential way, but they did enter into the, into the stuff that I'm telling you here about some, uh, I mean, this paper here at Galper and Howe and Stell and so on, with, I think they did enter into that, but not in an essential way. I mean, um, and some of these other papers, yeah, that, that played a role, but I don't think it ever played as a fact, but it didn't play an essential role, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. I think there have been other papers. I mean, there are very, lots of other papers, of course, on some of these stuff. I mean, which, which, for which I've started from trying to make something out of that. Um, I mean, there's a certain amount, there's quite a lot about, I think about, looking for kind of instanton type solutions of Yang Mills theories, which in various dimensions, you know, the octonionic instantons and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think that they use, they use that idea in a much more. Um, uh, the basis of the whole vibrations, the dimension. Yeah, they, they dimension use, they four, use that as a. Four, four as eight. These that's right. So. The spheres uh, in the constructions that we talked about. Yeah. I, I don't remember now, but I, my recollection is it wasn't essential to, the, to, the, to this discussion here. Um, but it does come, but I know it, it enters into this uh, solving Yang Mills, which I've also looked at a little bit in the past. I don't know how, but, um, and maybe supersymmetry actually comes into that, into that too. Probably does actually, because um, I mean, all of these kind of instanton type things are kind of closely connected to supersymmetry. So I, I suspect that that's another way of getting so some of these dimensions in. But in that, in that context, I think it would be much more important, yeah. Jose has a comment in the chat. Jose, do you want to say it loud? Yeah, well, how do I, can I read the chat somewhere? I'm not sure how to do that. And you need to press the chat button at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, so all, all I wanted to say was that in the case of, um, in, in, in precisely the, the spinner representations that Paul just talked about, the um, uh, if you if you square the spinner to get a to get a vector, you can make it such that this vector is null. Yeah, so it defines a null line, and that is precisely when you projectivize. That's precisely the, the hop vibration in, in each of the four cases. Yeah. Ah uh, yes, okay. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I was, I was, I was, I was trying to search for for comments, and the, I, I'm somehow supposed to look at here. I've seen Porsche. I don't, I don't get it. Security participants. I only have nothing appears at the bottom of my screen. But uh. may I, may I ask one? Uh, this is maybe kind of a broad, a broad question, but yeah. so in regarding how this might connect to the other talks in the workshop, I, you, you, I think in a number of the talks, the um, the two by two. Uh, uh, Hermitian Jordan algebra over the yeah over the I mean non division I, algebras will will appear and play a role in the talk yeah connecting that's, those that's, that's right I mean I'm sure that and there was yeah that's right so so uh, where I, go I was just going to ask I was just going to I was just going to ask and and of course the vast generalizations um, of that and of course the prior things of of uh, of uh, Kramer and Julia and so on you know, all the E8 and so on. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure they, 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 they will, they, yeah, that seems in a way much more likely to, for that to play a, 
the connection to the standard model. Right. Um, I was just going to ask, and, 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 and related to that, I mean, somehow your, your story here involved the 2x2 two two case. Uh, did you, does, does, does the 3x3 three three case show up anywhere? I mean, I know that, the, that this doesn't have, a, as far as I'm aware, there's no simple corresponding spinner interpretation in that case. Well, um, yeah, I mean, to some, to, well, actually, Sierra was sort of trying to do that in his paper here. Because, and in fact, I think uh, various people, C. Wall has also written a paper about this, where you can, you can try to take the point of view that since two by two matrices, since Minkowski spaces, uh, you know, can be point in Minkowski spaces, two by two emission matrices, it's, when you go up to higher dimensions, instead of going up to higher dimensions where the, where the group is again, the Lorentz group, you go up in a different way. You go up to three by three emission matrices, and you get the corresponding um, what is it? Orthom Automorphisms group, the other one, uh, structure group of the Jordan algebra, as mm -hmm. the as as the analog of a Lorentz group. So I mean, in the way, way, way it suggests that when you go up in dimensions, you go up in a very different way. You don't preserve a kind of some orthogonal group structure. Um, it's a different way of going up in dimensions. Now, um, so I think that's an interesting idea, but you can, you can try to say, well, and so he was trying to do that. Also, Cedarwald has written a paper trying to do that. I've had some remarks on it somewhere, but I don't know exactly where it goes. I mean, um, um, or indeed how that would have something to do with, you know, maybe that direction is, uh, so I, yes, it's a very interesting direction, but I think it's fair to say that it hasn't really gone very far. I mean, also, of course, a lot of the motivation for a lot of this stuff comes from string theory. As I mentioned, you know, it was after Green and Schwartz uh, cubic identity that people started looking at these things again. A little bit. So, and that's all in 10 dimensions with an SO, you know, 10 and so on, also 11 dimensional supergravity. So um, you're abandoning all of that, it seems, when you go into this other, other direction. So it's a direction which perhaps is, should be explored more. Um, it has been explored a little bit, but nothing concrete has come out, I think, which has in, encouraged anybody to, to say, yeah, this is it. So I think, yes, it's interesting that there were these, in fact, somehow that these, there are actually uh, uh, various connections uh, with also with supersymmetry, the various connections of the division algebras and so on. And they go in different directions and they're not obviously compatible. And they, maybe they're not compatible and you have to choose. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate. You'd like, if you're a believer in, uh, you know, <laughs> in it, you'd like it to, to uh, only work in one way ultimately. But you know, that's the way that, uh, I mean, it was the case that, you know, in field theory, we used to have to work have to choose a dimension, but now we know really you have to use them all at once because that's it's really you know M theory. You really have to do do everything at once. So maybe they, they, there's another kind of bigger picture in which they all pair at once. I I don't know, but it's true that there are there are other directions. Okay, thanks. There's another question in the chat. Uh, can you explain uh, what exactly is the cubic identity in the context of Jordan algebras? Yes, uh, yes, I can explain it. Uh, it's basically, yeah, that's, that's very simple. You take uh, uh, the cubic identity can be viewed, I mean, it's an identity with gamma matrices, but if you contract all the indices with just commuting spinners, you can simply view it as, a, as an identity cubic in, in commuting spinners. Now, the point is, is that if you take the three by three Jordan algebra, you can simply break it into, uh, as, as we heard, in fact, last week, you can simply break it into a two by two block uh, and, and, and the, and the one, by, well, one by one and one by two. Now the one by two, the orthogonal blocks are basically spinners. And, and the point is now, if you look at the Jordan density for the three by three case, and you, and you sort of break it up into this, in this structure, then that identity implies various sub identities. And essentially it ends up applying an identity for the so that you can, your, you, your commuting spinner over the reals complex quaternions and octonions is now just the off-diagonal element in, it's now the off-diagonal element in the, 
in these three by three matrices. Now the Jordan identity involves you know, three different elements. So it's gonna give you some, something cubic in you. Uh, so can I just continue on that? The, the J3O also has a characteristic equation, which is cubic and depends on the trace, the determinant and this two form. Is this in any way related to the cubic identity you're talking about? Um, well, it's, it's, that means to the Jordan identity, basically, although the way Sierra does it in his paper is not by writing down the Jordan identity, but it must be equivalent to that. Um, so, I mean, I, yes, I was at some point going to sit down and when I was re-looking at his paper again, I thought, well, I should, I should simply write down the Jordan identity into it. I think it's been noticed probably later by other, well, in fact, Shrey, I mean, other people have done it. So my guess is it's already in the literature. I mean, uh, uh, but yes, I, I mean, it's, um, yeah, so I mean, so actually, I, I, I don't have a, I mean, I didn't actually, but th that's how it must work. Because it is a cubic identity in spinners. And uh, the spinner in question is the off diagonal component of this three by three emission matrices. And the mission matrices to be jo the Jordan identity is precisely, I and mean, of course it's an identity. So uh, you'll just discover that it's an identity, right? So okay. in fact, so what, what happens is people just, when you're showing that the, when you're showing that the three by three octonionic matrices satisfies the Jordan identity, which obviously was done by presumably um, back in Jordan von Neumann and Wigner. The point is, if you do that calculation, but breaking the three-dimensional identities, three-dimensional matrices up into two by two, you know, into those blocks, and actually following through the calculation, you'll discover that at some point you're using the cubic identity. So, so if I wanted to find out the eigenvalues of this three by three matrix in the octonionic case, I would essentially be using the identity or that's something different? The eigenvalues. Yeah, did, sorry, the I eigenvalues, a, did you say? Yes, yes, yes. I yeah, um, yeah, well, there is actually a paper precisely about eigenvalues of, of the, uh, three by three, that's by, by Dre and- um, Yeah, yeah, um, Tim and Dre and Manol have a paper, yes. Yeah, yes. right, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I came across their paper recently looking through the things, but I, I haven't read it really. Yeah, you know, the reason I brought it up is uh, if you make a octodionic representation for the standard model fermions using yeah. the three fermion generations uh, in this matrix, and you try to find out eigenvalues, you're probably making an interesting contact with the fundamental dimensionless constants of the standard model. No one, like suppose I want to look into mass ratios. The, I expect that these, I think the three generations differ only in masses. I expect these eigenvalues to have something to possibly do with mass ratios. That's why I brought this up. Have you come? And this is very close to what Dre and Mano almost came to. I mean, they wrote down the eigenvalue equation, which is a cubic, yeah. but uh, they didn't solve it. And as far as I know, nobody's tried to solve it, but we know from already quite some work that if we use say the Clifford algebra CL6 complexified, we have a basis for uh, the fermions of three generations. I just need to plug it in and find the eigenvalues. They are real. And I should be asking what exactly do those eigenvalues mean? Um, so do, do you... Comment on the question. It, well, it's a good point. I mean, but the point, let's, let's remember what I was saying before is that this, this identity, I mean, literally is an identity. So actually you don't need to know it, right? I mean, it, you just, um, it, will, it will just, okay. you know, if you do your calculation correctly, it will just uh, be what it is. I mean, so in some sense, being an identity, I mean, it means that you don't need to know what it is. They just, you know, after all, we know that the three by three emission matrices do satisfy the Jordan identity. I think there's, I think there's an eight, there's an, there's an, there's an octic invariant called the Glenny identity, which is not satisfied by the uh, Jordan, by the three by, it's satisfied by emission matrices over reals of any, of any rank over reals complex quaternions, but it's not satisfied by the, um, by the three by three 
of tonionic matrices. And that's the way that you show that the, that's the simplest way I think to show that it's an exceptional Jordan algebra. I mean, I think that mm -hmm. the result okay. goes back to uh, Albert, is it? it's something that sometimes it's called the exceptional Jordan algebra. But one way to show this is an exceptional Jordan algebra is to show that for any, for if that assuming uh, associativity, you, you can prove an identity for, for three by three matrices over, R, over RCH. In fact, I think it's N by N identities, but in any case, it's the so-called Glenny identity, optic mm -hmm. identity. And it's okay. the, uh, yeah. the, uh, the octoning on it once um, failed to satisfy that. Okay. There's another Thank question. You. Lee uh, Smalling has a question. Yeah. Paul, Lee. it's nice to see you after a long time. Ah, Lee. Hi, Lee. Yeah. Yes. Hi. I really have a question which is in the way of advice. I had one effort to get involved in this kind of stuff about 20 years ago where I wrote a paper on the matrix string using the exceptional Jordan algebra. And everything seemed to work beautifully, except that my fermions, of course, were bosonic. Yeah, were well, actually, interesting that you, you make that point because there is a paper by um, Del Burgo and I've got a bunch of them um, here. Uh, Del Burgo, is, is it one by, I've been sort of collecting a little bit here, these things. I, it's by Del Bulgo and- um, Probably since. And somebody, anyway. Mm -hmm. I think I don't have it because I think that um, you can't, I mean, it's it's in one of these journals that you have to go to the library and make a photo, or photocopy, you know? Oh my God. Um, <clears throat> so you, uh, uh, but, 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 but they, um, I think I do have a, actually have a, you know, a hard copy in Cambridge. Uh, but they do, is they try to do, uh, use the, the exceptional Jordan algebra for, to construct, uh, you know, construction of the super string. But that they, that of course, they realize the point at some point they have to put anti-commuting variables into the, into the off-diagonal elements. And then they're no longer octonian. They no longer have the algebra. Of octonian. But um, you know, then then I mean, I don't see that what they're doing really is Jordan algebra anymore. Maybe some kind of I mean, also super Jordan algebras, but um, which I know actually not a lot about. But you would think if one is doing super symmetry, one should look at super Jordan algebras too. I'm sure Murat Kanidan has done that. <laughs> we we talked to him anyway. Yeah, that seemed to be a, a fatal flaw, but I had some fun with it at the time. I can only just hear you, Lee. I, I just that seemed we didn't know what to do after that. that yeah, was, well, I'm afraid I I can't thing. offer a whole lot of advice. Okay, um, very good. Yeah. Okay, so maybe. We reached the end of the questions. Yeah. Um, let's thank Paul again. It was a very interesting talk. Sure.